The Lord be with you. We welcome you today in the name of Jesus as we gather for worship. First of all, thank you, Carrie, for leading our bells. Thank you for the young and young at heart for playing bells today. Our goal is every first Sunday of the month. So if you want to kind of plan on that, be a little early so kids can slide up or you can slide up with your kids and join us for bells. We would love to welcome you to participate. What a neat thing to, to gather together. And if you've never seen this before, all you have to do is know colors. You don't have to practice in advance. So if you'd like to do that, when the card comes up with your color, you ring your colored bell. So it's a great, great easy way and a fun way to involve kids and adults together. So thank you, Carrie, for doing that. Okay, today is a special day in the church here. You can see the title on the screen, All Saints Day. We'll have opportunity to talk more about what that is as we get to our message today. But how the service will begin in just a moment, this beautiful hymn for all the saints, we will be singing through this hymn. We're going to pause, sing two verses and pause. And during that pause, we will begin to remember those individuals who have been buried, connected to Zion over the past 12 months. And we also understand that others of you have lost loved ones who uh, live elsewhere. And so we, at the end of those names, we will have a moment of silence to remember that individual. So that's an opportunity for you to remember. So each name will be read and a chime will sound for each name. We'll observe that moment of silence and we'll go through each name in that, that order. So we'll sing two verses, pause for the first section of names, sing two more verses, have more names, and process through that. It's important for a variety of reasons to observe All Saints Day. One is obviously to remember. It's important to remember those we love who have died with the confession of Christ in their heart. It's very important. But it's also important to give thanks to God for the grace he has shown to them in redeeming them and bringing them into his, to his presence to await the resurrection. So the promise of reunion that we have in Christ. So it's a day to give thanks to God for the grace that he gives to us in his son, Jesus Christ. And so that theme will come out very clearly today. One other quick announcement, just to make, oh, two other, I should say. One is happening this evening. At five to seven, we'll have supper included in this event. This is for families with teens and tweens or anybody who has any connection to teens and tweens. Lutheran Family Service will be here. We're going to have parallel tracks with one uh, counselor speaking to youth, one speaking to adults, and really addressing the question, what is normal? So my kid does this. Is that normal? My kid is experiencing this. Is that a normal thing they're just going to grow out of, or is that something that I need to talk to somebody about? Please tell me that others of you who have raised kids have asked that question before, right? Is this normal? So we're going to be asking that question this evening, so we'll have a, a time for them to teach and to share, a time to eat, and an activity we'll be doing this evening in family groups. So I invite you, please be a part of this. This is for anyone and everyone in our communities around, and we invite you to be here tonight at 5 o'clock for that event. And then tomorrow at 1.30 in the afternoon, the Fellowship Club has moved their meeting times to the afternoon, which may be better for some of you who may not prefer to go out in the evening. So 1.30 tomorrow afternoon, Pastor Rigert will be leading this. All are invited to join the Fellowship Club tomorrow at 1.30 in the afternoon. Okay, I think that covers those announcements. As we turn to our first hymn, remember we'll sing two verses and then we'll list the names and then at the eighth verse, we will sit, we'll stand for the Trinitarian conclusion. So we sing our first two verses.
Phyllis Faye Lamp. Lois Jean Peters. Max James Sanford. Lucille Emma Ress. Carol Jean Call. Edna Velma Nissen. Dwayne Arthur Burr. Margaret Louise Bacchus. Arlene Sophia Moore. Valda Ann Lamp. Joan Lorraine Nelk. Gordon Jean Schmarzo. Ronald Henry Schilling. Jed Daniel Rieselman. 
Judith K. Wagner. Jean Carl Borkowski. Betty Jean Mason. We observe a moment of silence to remember all those who have lost loved ones over the last year. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness deliver me. For you are my rock and my fortress. And for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Almighty God, we give thanks for all your goodness and bless you for the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your holy church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us 
and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to your service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Save and defend your whole church, purchased with the precious blood of Christ. Strengthen your faithful people through the word and the holy sacraments, making them perfect in love and in all good works, and establishing in them the faith once delivered to the saints. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Grant your wisdom and heavenly grace to all pastors and to those who hold office in your church, that by their devoted service, faith may abound and your kingdom increase. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Send the light of your truth into all the earth. Raise up faithful servants of Christ to advance the gospel both at home and in distant lands. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Preserve our nation in justice and honor, that we may lead a peaceable life with integrity. Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of this Iowa, and to all those who make and minister and judge our laws. Help them to serve this people according to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Take from us all hatred and prejudice. Give us the spirit of love and order our days in your peace. Prosper the labor of those whose work, who work to bring peace and justice to the nations of the world, that mutual understanding and common endeavor may be increased among all peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless the schools of the church and our colleges, universities, and centers of research, and those who teach and work in them. Grant your wisdom in such measure that people may serve you honorably in church and state, and that our common life may be conformed to the ways of your truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sanctify our homes with your presence and bless them with joy. Keep our children in the covenant of their baptism and enable their parents to bring them up in lives of faith and devotion. Unite the members of all families in a spirit of affection and service that they may show your praise in our land and in all the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let your blessing remain upon the seed time and harvest, the commerce and industry, the leisure and rest, the arts and culture of our people. Take under your special protection those whose work is difficult or dangerous and be with all who put their hands to any useful task. Give them the just rewards for their labor and the knowledge that their work is a blessing in your sight. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By your word and Holy Spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Be with those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those to whom death draws near. Bring consolation to those in sorrow and grant to all a measure of your love, taking them into your tender care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served in your church on earth who now rest from their labors. Keep us in fellowship with all your saints and bring us at last to the joys of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. May be seated for our hymn.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, you knit together your faithful people of all times and places into one holy communion, the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant us so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living, that together with them we may come to the unspeakable joys you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Revelation. And again, the book of Revelation is what we call an apocalyptic prophecy. So as the genre of prophecy, it's giving us um, an advanced image or description of what is to come, what we can expect to live through. And as an apocalypse, an apocalyptic genre is highly symbolic, exceedingly symbolic, giving us a heaven's eye view of realities on earth. And so in the first section here, you're going to hear this number of 144,000, listing off 12,000 from each tribe. And that very much is a symbolic number of completeness, and we will see that number explode into an immeasurable number as, as John then sees the whole host of those redeemed in the Lord's presence. And we'll have opportunity to visit more about that in a few minutes. John writes, beginning with verse number two, Then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Judah were sealed, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every tribe, from, all tri from, all, from, uh, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and where, from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, do you know... And he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from 1 John chapter 3, where John extols this lavish love of God that he gives to us in his son Jesus to the point that we would be called children of God. And that should never cease to amaze us. John writes, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, 
we shall be like him because we shall, shall, we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand and we sing together our Alleluia and verse. In the Holy Gospel, according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter, Glory to you, O Lord. This shows up in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. These are commonly called the Beatitudes. The word that you will hear repeated is the word blessed. Think basically equivalent of saved, redeemed. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Kids, come on up and find a seat. Come on up. Welcome. Good morning. Welcome, welcome. Love seeing you guys here. We have one very simple task today we're trying to do because we're going to be using this word over and over. We've already used it several times this morning. It's the word saint. That's a really important word, and we use it a lot on days like today. What do we mean when we say the word saint? What is a saint? Let me help you understand what the word saint is so we can appreciate it. A saint, first of all, is not someone who was really extra special good and they earned their way to heaven because they were so amazingly good that God said, you know what, you deserve this. No, that's not a saint because honestly, none of us deserve the things that God gives to us because, well, if we've ever looked at the Ten Commandments, um, we don't keep them. So a saint is not someone who's extra special good. A saint is someone who has been forgiven by Jesus. That Jesus shed his blood for this person and he washed those sins away in baptism. And he puts his word of forgiveness in their ears and in their hearts and creates this faith which trusts him and receives all the goodness, all the cleanness, all the purity, all the wonderful things of God that saint receives in themselves. So a saint is not someone who does something, but someone who receives something. And today, you heard us name several names today. Some of you know some of those names, and they're very important to you. They're very important people, and we love them. And we remember their names, and we call them saints. Not because they were perfect, because they're just like the rest of us. They had things they did wrong too. They're called sins. But we call them saints because we know that Jesus died for them and washed away all their sins and filled them with all his goodness and now he has them with him and they're safe and they're happy and nothing bad happens there. And so we're really happy for them today because they're with Jesus. We're sad for us because we're not with them. 
but we're happy for them because they're with Jesus. And they are God's saints. That's pretty important. So we remember God's saints and the good things that God gave to them, and we do remember the good things that they taught us in the way that they lived. But most especially we remember that Jesus loves them, and they're with Jesus now, and they're happy. And that gives us happiness in our hearts. So when you hear that word saint, remember that's not someone who does something, but someone who receives something from God. All right, thanks for your good listening. You can head back to your seats and we'll sing our next song. Grace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before I get to our message for today, I wanted to highlight one thing from that hymn we just finished. And this will be for all of you, uh, but especially those of you who maybe have journeyed through years ago our uh, capital campaign and, and remodel project. And some of you may remember the day we brought the beam in that we hung that movable wall from in our fellowship hall. 
If you weren't here for that, ask some of our members who have been around for a while. They'll tell you about bringing that beam in. That was a pretty impressive beam we rolled in here and with an inch clearance on either side, put it on its pedestals. But on the top of that beam is written verse number four. Engines and steel, loud pounding hammers, sing to the Lord a new song. Limestone and beams, loud building workers, sing to the Lord a new song. Uh, so, uh, for uh, curiosity's sake, if ever you're crawling around in the roof and find that written on that beam, that was, we put that there on purpose as a, a great song to remember what we were doing in that remodel project and hanging that beam and giving praise to God in the process. So, that has nothing to do with the sermon, but I thought you may appreciate knowing that. So, for our message today, God is going to speak to us through our reading from Revelation 7, along with other selected texts that we're going to highlight along the way. As you know, today is All Saints Day, or we're observing All Saints Day. No, All Saints Day is actually on November 1st. So, this is an important day in the church, but it's one that raises all sorts of questions and we're going to spend our time today, together today trying to answer as many of those questions as we can. So I think the first question we need to ask and, and need to answer is pretty basic, but it's pretty important. I spoke about it with the children. What is a saint? Well, to answer that question, it's actually answered for you in the front of your hymnal. If you were curious, you could turn there. I'll put the words on the screen. Roman numeral 12 says this. For Lutherans, saints aren't people who did more than enough to merit heaven. Rather, they are sinners who received the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. Sinners who had their sins washed away in holy baptism and sinners who remain steadfast in the faith until they breathe their last breath. Our celebration, All Saints Day, is centered on Jesus' work for them and on their positive example to us. So that gets at our second question, which is, well, why do we celebrate All Saints Day or any Saints Day for that matter? Now, remember last week when I referenced the Augsburg Confession, right? Well, that confession says this, our churches teach that the remembrance of the saints is to be commended in order that we may imitate their faith and good works according to our calling. So the front of our hymnal actually puts it this way for us. The Lutheran reformers understood that there were great, was great benefit in remembering the saints whom God has given to his church. The apology of the Augsburg Confession, or defense is what that word apology means here, gives three reasons for such honor. First, we thank God for giving faithful servants to his church. Second, through such remembrance, our faith is strengthened as we see the mercy that God extended to his saints of old. Third, these saints are examples by which we may imitate both their faith and their holy living according to our calling in life. So, on All Saints Day, we thank God for his grace in Christ to the saints who have gone before us. Even as we continue to give him praise for the grace that he lovingly gives to his church on earth through his word and sacraments. So that means it is right and proper for us on this day and all throughout the year to remember our loved ones who have gone before us in the faith. It is right and proper to remember and celebrate God's grace to them and to remember and imitate the virtues that they practiced in this life. So we started this morning with the names of our loved ones who have gone before us. And like so many of you, these names mean so much. And their memories are so important to us. And the virtues that we saw embodied and practiced in their lives, they still influence us and shape us today. And that is right. And that is good. And today is a day we remember them together. Today is a day we praise God for the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed so that they might be forgiven and saved, that, that we might have the promise that death has not separated us forever, that death is not the end of our relationship, but death has merely interrupted it. This is such an important day 
for the church. And those of you who have lost loved ones, you know how hard it is just to watch the world go back to normal. You know how hard it is to see people innocently, but just laughing and smiling. You know how hard it is to feel like the world has forgotten the person that you so deeply love. That's why we need All Saints Day. It's the church's way of saying, we have not forgotten. We remember. We grieve with you. We hope with you. We walk in faith with you. We confess Jesus with you, and we long for his coming, the resurrection of the dead, the reunion that that he has promised to the redeemed, and the renewal of all things. That's why we need All Saints Day. Now, if your loved one has been called from this life into the presence of the Lord, you may find yourself with questions that you never had before, or maybe those questions have just become more personal and more urgent. We're going to answer a few of those questions today, but if you still have questions, I have resources I'm happy to share with you, and I'm more than happy to visit with you. So at some point, you have asked, or you will ask, what are the saints in heaven doing? Let's look at a few key texts that give us glimpses into this. And understand, these are just glimpses. Because the Bible actually doesn't give us a lengthy description of like the daily agenda in heaven. It gives us enough to know the God of heaven, but not enough to know the daily schedule in heaven. Let's start with Romans chapter 8. Paul writes, For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is really important. Death does not separate us from God's love for us in Jesus. Death separates us from one another for a time, and that is profoundly painful but not from God's love for us in Jesus. So if your loved one has died in the faith, he or she is not separated from God. In fact, they are with God. And the psalmist writes about being with God or being in God's presence in Psalm 16. Here's what he says. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures of forevermore. Now really soak that in, okay? Your loved one is experiencing the fullness of joy. The word means completely satisfied, completely filled up, not lacking or wanting anything. I mean, we could never provide that for them here. I know our hearts are pierced by grief, but our loved ones, they are filled with joy. They live day in and day out with the never-ending pleasures of God. They don't get sick. They don't don't battle depression. Nothing hurts. They are happy and full. I mean, isn't that what we want for them? They have it in the presence of the Lord. They have what they never had here. That's why Paul says in Philippians 1, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then he confesses that to depart and be with Christ was far better. For the Christian, death is gain. Being freed from this broken, sin-cursed world to be with our Savior, that's better. And the believers who have gone before us, they are enjoying it. They are fully enjoying it. And that that gives our hearts peace. Now let me take a minute to share one more glimpse. We read it in our Revelation 7 text. John is describing the vision he had of the saints of God coming out of the, the great tribulation, this period of turmoil and hardship between Christ's ascension and return. And he sees these saints, these people who have been washed by the blood of the Lamb and made clean, righteous, able to stand in God's presence. And here's what he says. Therefore, 
they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is marvelous. First, our loved ones who have died with Christ's confession in their hearts are in God's presence, and they're serving him. The word has a, actually has a worship connotation, so they're, they're joyfully worshiping their God. And God is sheltering them. He's shielding them, keeping them until the day of resurrection and the renewal of all things. How comforting is that? So our loved ones, they are alive, they are alert and happy and free and protected. They are reveling in the fullness of joy because they are with Jesus. They have what we could never provide for them here, what our fallen world could never give them. So even though our hearts are hurting, they don't have to hurt for our loved ones because they're happy and well. Now, there are so many more questions I wish we had time to really dig into. Questions like, are our loved ones aware of life on earth? And can we or should we talk to them? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you just a very cursory answer to these questions and then invite you to come talk to me if you want to talk more about this and go deeper. So are our loved ones aware of life on earth? Scripture hints at a general awareness, but it doesn't go into specifics. So we just need to make sure we don't overstate this point to the point that we are confidently asserting things that, that we really can't say with certainty, right? So we probably can't assert things like that our loved one knows exactly how many points we scored in a ball game or whose birthday party we went to, all right? That may be saying more than we can say with certainty. It could be true. Scripture just doesn't go into great detail there. So we just have to let let that stand and say, maybe, but we can only go as far as Scripture goes and not farther. Now, can we or should we talk to them? I'll offer this, and then we can go deeper later if you like. Maybe. First, let me clarify this. We have no promise, we need to acknowledge this, we have no promise that they hear us, and we need to acknowledge that. They, may, they might hear us, but we just simply have no explicit promise in Scripture. Second, this is important, we do not pray to them. They might pray for us, but we do not pray to them or ask them to pray for us because we have no command or promise from Scripture to do so. We have only one intermediary, and that is Jesus Christ. Okay, third, this is important. We do not seek to summon the souls of the dead into our presence to communicate with them. We don't do that. That is an occult practice, and it is forbidden and condemned by Scripture. Fourth, and this is important, we can ask God to bring our heartfelt messages to our loved ones in heaven. You can ask God, tell my loved one I love them. You can talk to God like that. You can ask him, tell them I miss them. You can even say things like, tell them that so-and-so is doing well. You can ask God to do that. And you can trust that God in his love will do what is right. So you can ask God, tell my loved one I miss them. Tell them we love them. You can talk to God and ask. Know that he loves you. And in his love, He'll do what's right. Now, one more point I want to make, and this is a big one. It's really important. And I'm, to do that, I'm going to take us to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Okay, so we've been talking about present heaven, about the place the souls of Christians go when their bodies die. And it's amazing, and it's hopeful and encouraging, right? In God's presence, the fullness of joy, rest and refreshment, worship, deep and abiding happiness. But you know what? It's actually not the end of the story. In fact, it's not even the ultimate goal of the story. So I want to wrap up our time together in God's Word by taking us 
to the ultimate goal of the story. Now, we could go a lot of places in Scripture to accomplish this. Our epistle reading from 1 John would be one of them for today. But we're going to take ourselves and limit ourselves just to 2 Corinthians 4. There's a lot of really great stuff in chapter 4 and then also in chapter 5. But for the sake of time, we're just going to zero in on a few verses. Paul says this, We know that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. Now that's absolutely fantastic. Look what, look, look what, look what Paul bakes into these verses, right? First, there's resurrection, right? Physical, bodily resurrection. God's saints are going to be raised just like Jesus was raised in physical, glorified bodies. I mean, how exciting is that? Second, reunion. Paul says God is going to bring us together. That means that this separation, that's temporary. The separation that is killing us, the separation that is keeping us from laughing and playing and hugging and eating and talking together, that separation is temporary because there's a reunion coming. And if we had time, we'd talk about the feast that's going to be a part of that reunion. I mean, it's going to be outstanding. But third, retained identities. And I love this. So look what Paul says, right? He, he doesn't say, God is going to raise generic human beings. No, he says, God is going to raise you and us, specific people with specific stories that he's going to bathe in the glory of God, stories that are going to be brought to their completion, stories that are going to be caught up into God's grand epic story of salvation. So your loved one in heaven, he, she, they haven't lost their identity. You will see them and love them and cherish them again. If you die before Jesus returns, then you'll see them in heaven. If Jesus returns first, then you'll see them on the renewed earth. And here's the really great thing about God's glory, right? All the good stuff that you loved about them will actually be better. And all the bad stuff, it'll be gone. So here's the thing, and we all know this. We're not there yet, are we? Not yet. We're not there yet. We're still mucking about here in sin and sorrow and death, and it hurts. I mean, it really hurts, doesn't it? What do we do until then? Well, Scripture says a lot about this, but let me just share what Paul offers just a few verses later in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to things that are unseen for the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal so we've got affliction we've got sorrow we've got loss and hurt and grief and it's real it's painfully real but it does not compare to the glory that's coming. See, the shadow of our suffering and pain, it's, it's not going to darken God's glory. Instead, the glory of God is going to banish the shadows of our pain. That's what Paul is exhorting us to do. He wants us to adopt this resurrection perspective, all right? To, to live and park yourself here in this resurrection perspective. All right? To live and park your family here in this resurrection perspective. And you need this because the world is broken and cursed by sin and it is killing us and stealing our loved ones at a frenetic pace and we can't stop it. So we need a resurrection perspective. We need the confidence and the hope that come from this resurrection perspective. We need something bigger and stronger and better to cling to, and we have it in Jesus and his promises. And this is why we are celebrating All Saints Day, because death is real. But if I can put it this way, Jesus, heaven, the resurrection, the reunion, the renewal of all things, they are more real. Death is for now. Jesus and his promises, they are forever. And that's what we are confessing 
on All Saints Day. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord to life everlasting. Amen. Now I invite you to stand. And we have this great privilege. And I want you to remember, when we confess this, we're not just confessing this with the people here. We're confessing this with the people around the world and remembering that those who have gone before us have confessed this same faith. So we confess it joyfully and boldly. Together we confess. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Children, you can bring your offering forward and invite choir forward.
Beautiful words and beautifully sung and played. Thank you. Let us stand to pray. Lord God, on this All Saints Day, we remember those who have gone before us with Christ's confession on their lips and in their hearts. And we give you thanks that because Christ has shed his blood for them and he has enabled them to confess Christ in faith, that they now are with you. They are experiencing the fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore, unable to be separated from your love for them in Jesus. And yet our hearts, although filled with joy for them, yet we struggle with grief and loss at our separation. Give us a resurrection perspective. Help us to confess it with joy, confidence, and hope. Help us to pass that confession onto our children and grandchildren. Help us to share that confession in our community, in word, and with the joy that we exude from our very the core of our being. We thank you for the redemption that you provide for all your saints in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up Louise Kinnan, Justine Schwizo, Nancy Grimm, Julie Weller, Jeannie Grun, Sherry Steffes, Jim Devers, Rick Spock, John Sonickson, Gage Carlson, Joeen Bowman, Patty Meaves, Bob Hagedorn, Leggy Thompson, Virgin Kruger, Janet Smith, and Janice Munson. Give them grace for each day and the healing that you have in store for them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for the baptism of Bo Dearson. And we pray that you would bless him with true and abiding faith in Christ and enable his parents to raise him to know Jesus and confess him with confidence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for the family of Gary Vinky as they grieve his death. May they find peace in the promises of Jesus, and may all of us turn to Christ for hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Pastor Oliver, Pastor Lopez, Pastor Ferry, Pastor Mark and Megan Monti, for Pastor Sharp, for cross-cultural worker Molly. Give them joy as they confess Christ. By the working of your spirit through that word, open hearts to believe, to confess, and to be saved. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For law enforcement and military men and women, Scott Stribe, Stephen Graham, Marshall Hansen, Aaron Stokel, and Lillian Ginzen, protect them from harm, Lord God, and help us to find right and proper opportunity to show our gratitude. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our partnership with Trinity and Manila, that it may be strengthened and the gospel of the kingdom go forward. For our preschool, that the love of Jesus may be shared with children and families and beyond, that you would give wisdom and discernment to our teachers, that you would uphold them with a joyful spirit and let them each day see the image of God born by each child they are privileged to care for. Thank you for the privilege we have of confessing Christ in this place, of sharing Jesus together. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. I invite you to join us for a time of fellowship after worship. And a reminder, if you would ever like to sign up to host fellowship, we have some empty Sundays upcoming. We would welcome anyone to take a Sunday to share. And we turn to our final song. <laughs>